Welcome to today's webinar. Before we get started today, we have a few announcements. We know many of you are listening in from far away and can't attend local events or programs. This is the reason we provide this free webinar series. We often host multiple webinars per month, so please visit our website to view the current schedule for 2018. Simply visit our website at www.johnson-center.org and click on the webinars link on the right hand side. New webinars and events are often added, so if you are not on our email list, I encourage you to visit our website and click on the Join Our Email List link that appears on the homepage. To get instant news and events from the Johnson Center, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as we often announce grant and scholarship opportunities, research opportunities, and special events and presentations there. And be sure to check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the Johnson Center. There you will find a library of several of our past presentations. We have many exciting programs this summer, including our new counseling program for people on the spectrum, their family members, and special education professionals. There are sliding fee scales and grants to assist people and assist in accessing these services, as well as for diagnostic and assessment services. We will also host a series of free workshops for parents with free childcare available, including one upcoming in July on tantrums and meltdowns. Check out our Facebook page or website blog for more information. Also be sure to follow our colleagues at the Austin, at the Autism Research Institute as they host their own webinar initiative and they share some great resources on their website and social media pages. If you would like a certificate of attendance after today's webinar, look for a follow-up email in your, e in your inbox one hour after the webinar concludes or look for the link on our YouTube channel in the webinar description. It will contain instructions on how to get your certificate. If you have questions during the live webinar, you may type them in your GoToWebinar control panel. If you're watching a recording of this webinar, you may email questions to the presenter at info at johnson-center.org. Today's webinar is presented by Morgan Devlin. Morgan is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin, where she majored in psychology. She began her time at the Johnson Center as an intern and later joined the research staff now serving as an assistant research coordinator. Morgan works closely with children and their families through her efforts to recruit research participants and provide support to families and staff working on several different studies. Please welcome Morgan Devlin. Hi everyone, thank you for joining me today and welcome to our webinar. Today, I'm going to be giving you an update on the current status of research examining the symptoms of ASD and the effectiveness of treatments using various forms of technology. I do want to preface this by saying that research can take an admittedly long time. So while there is some empirical evidence out there, there is plenty more to be done and devices lacking such. Um, I first want to briefly go over the different types of interventions for ASD, and then I'll give you some examples of these interventions and their main goals. Next, I'll talk about the current roles of technology in this capacity, mainly how different types of technology are currently implemented in the various ASD interventions. I will then finish by providing updated examples of both interventions and technology and how they can work together. I will also touch on areas of emerging research as well. Whether it's at home or in the classroom, technology is a booming field that children with ASD can utilize and benefit from in more ways than one. My goals with this webinar are to define and explain the different types of empirically supported interventions for ASD. I also want to emphasize different types of technologies and describe their current roles in these interventions. And lastly, I want to provide specific examples of each and how they work together. Because technology is evolving rapidly and new discoveries and innovations are happening daily, I wanted to make this webinar a tool that you can use to navigate the waters of emerging tech and decide what devices and or software will be most beneficial for both your child with ASD and your family. I hope that as new devices and apps become available, you will be able to evaluate and make decisions based on your child's individual needs and whether or not that particular device or software will benefit them. I also want to stop here and remind you that this webinar will be made available for playback on our YouTube channel. I'm going to mention a lot of specific apps and devices that you may or may not have heard about prior to this webinar. 
while we don't share our slides, you will still be able to access this information once the webinar is over. So let's get started. I'm going to begin by giving a brief summary of the different types of interventions for ASD. As you may know, because no single cause of ASD has yet been identified, there is no single recognized treatment. The treatments or interventions for ASD vary widely and expand across a wide range of disciplines, from behavioral therapies to medication, as well as nutrition and dietary interventions. There are a multitude of areas of development that are affected by autism spectrum disorder and therefore multiple interventions. Each individual's treatment plan has goals based on the needs and skills of the individual. These treatment plans can vary drastically among individuals with ASD. Like Dr. Stephen Shore said, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Keep this in mind as we discuss different methods of intervention and what may or may not work best for your child. Like I mentioned, there are a ton of different interventions for ASD out there. Google ASD treatments and you can come up with some pretty interesting things and a list a mile long. It is not the case, however, that all of these interventions are empirically supported or backed by scientific research, although the most popular are. Interventions that research has shown to be an effective means of treatment for children with ASD are known as evidence-based practices. Evidence-based practices are unique because they provide an integration of the best and current empirical evidence, clinical and educational expertise, as well as the patient and caregiver perspectives. There are currently 27 evidence-based practices recognized by the National Professional Development Center of Autism Spectrum Disorder, or NPDC for short. We'll talk about a few of these specific practices later. Furthermore, the National Autism Center has performed essentially a meta-analysis or review of all of the educational and behavioral intervention literature targeting the core characteristics and associated symptoms of ASD and its outcomes. What is known as the National Standards Project was developed in order to provide straightforward information to parents, educators, and service providers that can help them to make informed treatment decisions, as well as to promote evidence-based practice in the treatment of ASD. The core features investigated in the literature include social skills, communication, repetitive or problem behavior, adaptive behavior, and academic skills. This project also aims to create guidelines for evidence-based practices for ASD that address the limitations of previous guidelines. So far, there have been two phases released. Phase one, released in 2009, examined and quantified the level of research supporting interventions that target the core characteristics of ASD in children, adolescents, and young adults under the age of 22 on the autism spectrum. Phase two, released in 2015, essentially provides an update to phase one. Combined, the two phases examined the literature from a span of close to 60 years, including over 400 scientific articles. The results of the most recent report of the National Standards Project, phase two, identified 14 established treatments for ASD. Established treatments are those tested by controlled scientific experiments which repeatedly produce beneficial outcomes and are known to be effective for individuals on the autism spectrums. These practices have the most empirical support or are backed by the most scientific research. Well, now you might be thinking that definition sounds pretty similar to the other thing we were just talking about, the evidence-based practices. Um, so what's the difference? Well, if you think back, the evidence-based practices contain a little something extra. While they too are supported by empirical evidence, they also incorporate clinical expertise as well as patient perspectives into their intervention strategies but you are right, they are still similar. So similar, in fact, that there are overlapping intervention strategies in what are considered evidence-based practices and established treatments. 21 of the practices identified by the NPDC as evidence-based were considered established by the National Standards Project. Again, the established treatments have the most scientific evidence backing the treatment investigated. Four NPDC evidence-based practices were considered emerging practices by the National Standards Project. These emerging practices don't have quite enough support to be considered established, but they do have some empirical support as opposed to other interventions that have none. By support, I mean published literature. For example, an emerging practice would have, say, four published peer-reviewed articles showing evidence of the treatment investigated as being effective for people with ASD whereas an established treatment would have nine published articles supporting this intervention. Now, I won't go over all 21 of the interventions these two institutions found in common, but I will hit a few of the important ones. 
For the purposes of this webinar, the practices I go over will be the most pertinent to technology being used as a method to implement the treatment or practice itself. A few of the different evidence-based practices fall under a single category in the National Standards Project, namely the behavioral interventions. I'll briefly go over a few of the established treatments now. As a disclaimer, I just want to say for the purposes of this webinar, I only want to describe and highlight key points of these intervention strategies to help you become more familiar with the terminology used and to expose you to different methods of treatment that may be beneficial to your child or family. Please do your research or seek advice from a qualified professional before implementing new treatments. The established treatments are defined by the National Autism Center, and you can find more information on these treatments by visiting their website. As I explain these different interventions, you can kind of develop a sense of the roles various forms of technology could play in each of these therapies. So keep that in the back of your mind as we go through them. First off, behavioral interventions are designed to reduce problem behavior and teach functional or alternative behaviors or skill through the application of basic principles of behavior change. This can include the use of prompts, extinction, redirection, or reinforcement. Treatments falling into this category reflect research representing the fields of applied behavior analysis, ABA, behavioral psychology, and positive behavior supports. Some other forms of behavioral intervention you might be familiar with include discrete trial training, task analysis, or time delay. Modeling interventions rely on an adult or peers providing a demonstration of the target behavior that should result in an imitation of the target behavior by the individual with ASD. Modeling can include simple and complex behaviors. This intervention is also often combined with other strategies such as prompting or reinforcement. Examples include, include live modeling and video modeling. Natural teaching strategies involve using primarily child-directed interactions to teach functional skills in the natural environment. So for example, um, social skills and peer work. These interventions often involve providing a stimulating environment modeling how to play, encouraging conversation, providing choices, and rewarding reasonable attempts. Examples of this type of approach um, can include, but are not limited to, focused stimulation, as well as incidental teaching. Parent training entails parents directly using individualized intervention practices with their child to increase positive learning opportunities in the acquisition of important skills. On the other hand, peer training interventions involve teaching children without disabilities strategies for facilitating play and social interactions with children on the autism spectrum. Peers may often include classmates or siblings. Other times, this can include both initiation training and peer training. These interventions may include components of other treatment packages as well, such as self-management for peers, prompting, reinforcement, etc. Common names for intervention strategies include peer networks, circle of friends, buddy skills packages, integrated playgroups, peer initiation training, and peer mediated social interactions. Pivotal response training, or PRT, is a treatment that focuses on targeting pivotal behavioral areas, such as motivation, self-management, and responsiveness. Key aspects of PRT intervention delivery focus on parent involvement in the intervention delivery and on intervention in the natural environment, such as homes and schools, with the goal of producing naturalized behavior improvements. Schedules are interventions that involve the presentation of a task list that communicates a series of activities or steps required to complete a specific activity. Schedules are often supplemented by other interventions, such, such as reinforcement. Schedules can take several forms, including written words, pictures, photographs, or workstations. Intervention, or similarly, excuse me, scripting interventions involve developing a verbal and or written script about a specific skill or situation which serves as a model for the child with ASD. Scripts are usually practiced before the skill is used in the actual situation. Self-management interventions involve promoting independence by teaching individuals with ASD to regulate their behavior by recording the occurrence or non-occurrence of the target behavior and securing reinforcement for doing so. Initial skills development may involve other strategies and may include the task of setting one's own goals. 
In addition, reinforcement is a component of this intervention with the individual with ASD independently seeking and or delivering reinforcers. Examples include the use of checklists, risk counters, visual prompts, and tokens. Lastly, story-based interventions involve a written description of the other situations under which specific behaviors are expected to occur. Like other interventions, stories may be supplemented with additional components like prompting, reinforcement, discussion, um, et cetera, among the other ones that we talked about earlier. Um, social stories are the most well-known story-based intervention, and they seek to answer the who, what, when, where, and why in order to improve perspective taking in different situations. Now, did you notice any interventions where technology might play an important role in the treatment itself? Maybe in interventions utilizing visual displays like modeling or story-based interventions. Perhaps other interventions where communication is a major component like scripting or PRT. Technology can be used as a tool to help individuals with ASD achieve, goal achieve goals outlined by these treatment plans. In fact, there are many different applications and systems that are tailored specifically to different areas where children with ASD struggle most. These types of devices and applications are known as technology-based interventions. Technology-based inter instruction and interventions were identified as an emerging practice by the NPDC and National Standards Project. One specific type of technology-based intervention worth mentioning is Augmentative and Alternative Communication, or AACs. Oops, sorry, my slides are a little behind. Um, certain AAC practices lack the amount of evidence found for established treatments, but have been recently been gaining enough evidence to be considered an evidence-based practice and an emerging treatment. AACs are one of the best examples of tech integrated into treatment intervention for individuals with ASD. Now that I've briefly gone over these different practices, I wanna talk about different forms of technology in their role or potential, potential role in ASD interventions. Again, because of the vast differences in symptomology among individuals with ASD, it is important to keep in mind how these different forms of technology would best suit your child. I'll revisit this idea later on. The earlier AAC models are more computer-based, analog, and much less versatile. While they, can, while they can and do still serve multiple functions, they aren't necessarily as accessible or flexible as, say, um, an iPad, for example. And this part has to do with the software made available for each of these devices, as well as the improvements in technology in general over the years. Some of the earliest AAC devices developed in the 80s don't have as much power as the smartphones of today. Nonetheless, it is not uncommon for old, older models to be recommended and utilized for certain individuals. This is one area of ASD intervention where technology has made the most impact on an, impact on an individual basis. AACs are very dependent on an individual's abilities and skills. As I mentioned earlier, every treatment plan is unique and based on the specific needs and skills of the individual seeking treatment. So what are these devices? Well, a brief overview would give you AAC divided into two categories unaided AAC and aided AAC. Unaided requires good fine motor skills, offers unlimited vocabulary, and is portable. Think sign language. Sign language requires fine motor skills for effective communication using hand signs, offers an expanded vocabulary, and your hands go everywhere you do, so maximum portability. Conversely, aided AAC requires lower fine motor skills, is more readily comprehensible, isn't as portable, and utilizes a more limited vocabulary. For example, these devices can include schedules, visual cues, electronic devices, um, communication boards and keyboards, speech generating devices, as well as visual scene displays. Basically, you can think of AAC devices as anything that provides the opportunity and promotes the child's ability to say anything about anything at any time. The goal of augmentative and alternative communication is to promote spontaneous novel utterance generation. These devices help to fulfill this goal by compensating for or replacing speech. Now let's take a look at the current state of some of these devices. Oh no, sorry about that. Let me get back to it. There we go. Um, 
I'll also go ahead and talk about the pros and cons um, without getting too specific regarding different um, devices as well as the different brands. So still a major player in the game, um, smart boards, a similar con concept to an overhead projector in transparent transparency sheets from a few years ago. A smart board is essentially a projector with light rays technology. Um, this technology uses lasers to recognize what the individual has written on the wall or projection and can differentiate between touch or pin use. Smart boards work better for a group setting and are typically utilized in classrooms. The smart board's um, large size allows for different levels of representation to meet the needs of different students. The smart boards also come equipped with microphones and cameras for auditory and visual applications as well. Um, similar to the smart boards, mini or Pico projectors can be thought of as personal projectors. They tend to work better for children who need one-on-one um, -on -one interaction separate from the group. These are extremely portable, and when connected to an iPad or other device, lessons and activities can happen virtually anywhere. Many projectors are also significantly cheaper as an alternative option if a smart board isn't feasible. As one example, smart boards or mini projectors can be utilized in story-based interventions. For example, let's say a class of children with ASD is preparing for an upcoming field trip to a local natural history museum. Um, as this trip is a drastic change from their everyday routine, the class can prepare for the trip together by using a visual, visual schedule or social story created on the smart board. This will help them know what to expect when visiting the museum and make for an easier transition. Um, kind of on a smaller scale, uh, for existing computers or if you're in the market for a new one, most laptops and um, PCs nowadays are built using multi-touch technology so you can physically interact with the device by touching the screen. Um, the Magic Touch by Keytech works for existing laptops and monitors by turning any monitor into a touch screen using a panel um, monitor over the existing one. Similar to the smart boards and mini projectors, these devices are not as portable as a smaller touch screen device like an iPad, um, but they are cheaper as an option for individuals who want the school environment at home. Touch screen devices also operate on a smaller scale than the smart boards as they are ideally used one-on-one -on -one with an individual. However, if you were wanting to um, kind of project to a larger audience, the Apple TV can mirror any screen from an iPhone, iPad, or Mac screen onto your TV or through a projector. Um, like I mentioned, it's best used for larger audiences at home. Similarly, the Amazon Fire Stick works in the same way with Android devices. Um, now, arguably, the most popular and prevalent form of technology used for um, as AACs are different applications implemented through iPads or other handheld devices or tablets. Um, while more expensive, these devices are portable, they're lightweight, and they host a vast multitude of software and applications with new ones developing every day. Um, the size of the tablets allows for maximum mobility while still offering a decently sized uh, interface, allowing children to be more hands-on and they can serve a variety of functions using the apps alone. A lot of AAC-specific apps have been and are being developed for the use by children with ASD. Other features of the tablets, like the camera, allow for better data collection, as well as a video and photo modeling, like we talked about earlier. Um, features like these also allow for a multimodality of cues presented by the device. Using short videos or other visual and auditory cues, tablets can be a helpful tool in modeling and behavioral interventions. Applications specific to self-management skills like Reminders or the Calendar app help promote independence by teaching users with ASD to regulate their behavior by recording their, the occurrence or non-occurrence of the target behavior, like setting a reminder to brush your teeth before bed. Mainstream tablets like the iPad, Windows Surface, or Samsung Galaxy are highly accessible and versatile. You can get most of these at your local Walmart or Target. However, it should be noted that not all, not all tablets are created equal. This might go without saying, but some brands can be significantly more expensive than others and less durable. Also, different devices run using different software, and not all software is compatible with all devices. You'll find this namely in your Apple and Android or Google products. 
the two biggest players on the market. If you have some sort of smart device at home, you probably already know that not all applications available in Apple's App Store are also available to be downloaded for Android devices via Google Play. Currently, there are more AAC apps available for Apple products and Android products at this time. Although I do want to point out that Android is becoming more cost effective as Google's Android software is compatible with multiple manufacturers of tablets like Samsung and Huawei, um, or as Apple's operating system will only work with the iPad or other Apple manufactured devices. Similarly, the Windows Surface tablet has even fewer apps available than Android or Apple compatible products. The Windows Surface, however, can run full Windows applications like Word, PowerPoint, and has USB ports to connect with other devices like hard drives and monitors. Um, Christian Carter of the Monarch Center for Autism makes a great point when he suggests um, the use of iPads and other handheld devices in the home. Um, he suggests using, if it's feasible, using two separate devices, one for play and one for assistance. Um, in an effort to make the most out of and in an effort to limit screen time. Um, like I mentioned, this can be pretty expensive. So um, while you may not be able to afford two completely separate devices, try switching different cases, um, two different colors, one color sign signaling the leisure activity time, like videos and games, um, and the other color sign signaling work time. You can also use the timer feature in conjunction with switching cases for added expectation management. And uh, later I will talk about different resources for purchasing these devices in an effort to try and save you some money. Um, next, I wanna move on to the home automation sector. Virtual assistants like Amazon's Alexa or Google Home work by responding to verbal prompts to answer questions or respond to a range of various commands. For example, Alexa, remind me to take out the trash in an hour, would result in a verbal cue one hour later to take out the trash. For individuals who respond better to visual cues, wireless light dimmers as well as smart light bulbs like the Philips Hue can be used to help indicate changes in their schedule or serve as notifications. For example, you can program the lights to flicker when a door opens or change color when you receive a text message. Some individuals with ASD struggle with elopement behavior. Smart door locks and sensors can help limit these behaviors by impeding them and notifying you. In addition to the door sensors, contact sensors as well as motion sensors and or security cameras can be an extremely beneficial at monitoring elopement behaviors as well. Security cameras can also be used to monitor therapy sessions or just general playtime from a different room while you're busy with other tasks. And then lastly, a mixture of robotics and home tech, Bluebee Pals are stuffed animals that can connect to an iPad via Bluetooth. An interactive plush, these stuffed animals can speak any text that the iPad will play, like output from an AAC app, for example. You can use the onboard iPad accessibility feature to read the text that is on the screen and type out the sentence. These plushes will also move their mouth as they sing songs, read stories, and afterwards can ask questions for comprehension. A majority of these devices can be paired together to operate in conjunction with one another. There are companies out there like Control 4 and Vivint who specialize in helping families with children on the spectrum design and install various systems of home automation. These systems can be costly, as you would imagine, um, so if you were wanting to take a stab at home automation yourself using your existing devices and incorporating a, new, a few new ones, you may want to try an alternative. Home automation can be extremely overwhelming for a lot of people, especially those that lack a technical nature. IFTTT stands for If This Then That. This app helps your apps and devices work together across various operating systems, brands, companies, developers, all of it. They have over 600 apps and devices partnered together to make your technology work for you. You can see some examples here on the screen. Um, for real life examples, for children who, who struggle with breaks in your teen and respond well to auditory prompts, using this app, you may find it helpful to link the child's calendar or other scheduling app to an Amazon Alexa set up in the child's room. 
in practice that this could look like the child enjoying free time before in a home therapy session. With the notification feature set up on the calendar app, the Am Amazon Alexa would notify the child 15, 10, and five minutes before a change in activity, preparing them for a break in routine using the verbal cue. 15 minutes until therapy session with Amanda. 10 minutes until therapy session. You get the picture. Um, for individuals who respond better to visual cues, using the Philips Hue smart bulbs paired with the calendar app to slowly dim as it gets closer to bedtime or turn green to signal that um, a therapy session is in progress. Another example of this helpful little app could be with the use of Wi-Fi enabled GE appliances. I think um, LG and Samsung offer them as well. These can be synced to your phone with IFTTT, allowing you to receive alerts if um, the oven was turned on or if it was turned off. This could be useful for an older child who is higher functioning and more independent and left home alone for a few hours while you're out running errands or just busy doing things in a different room. Um, if the oven is turned on, then a live stream of your home monitoring system or security cameras in the kitchen would automatically be streamed to your smartphone, allowing you to see who is using the oven in real time. Of course, all of this is dependent upon the devices you have in your home and the programs you use to run them, but I wanted to share this app as a tool for streamlining all of the different systems and helping make that whole entire process a little bit easier on you. Um, next, wearable technology is gaining a lot of popularity among ASD researchers um, because of its accessibility as well as its portability. Thanks to Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and other tech communication systems, Different devices can interact with each other, offering a multimodality of signals, meaning that the user can receive notifications in multiple ways. Wearable devices such as the Apple Watch, Fitbits, Pebble Watch, and others interact with your phone to share data from different apps. Generally, these wearable devices offer haptic cues or low intensity vibrations to notify you of incoming text messages, um, phone calls, reminders, calendar alerts, whatever you prefer via your notification settings. These devices offer a lot of possibilities for children with ASD. For example, if in a classroom setting, using features like messages, an educator or therapist could prompt a child with ASD to raise their hand if they knew an answer to a question or wanted to ask one. Heart rate monitors installed in wearable technology like Fitbits or the Apple Watch could allow for additional data collection and tracking for a child with ASD. The watches also offer a possibility of multimodality of information delivery and comprehension. Um, returning to my previous example in the classroom, if a child is interacting with their peer and the therapist or teacher wanted to prompt them to begin using a script that had been practiced beforehand for this interaction, the Apple Watch could allow for visual, auditory, haptic cues, or even a combination of the three to be sent to the child discreetly. Also, a useful self-management tool, this wearable device allows the child wearing it to track his or her own behaviors and physiological responses in order to recognize emotions and regulate their behavior. It has been shown that anxiety is hard to measure in children with ASD due to an inability to express their emotions and or communicate them effectively. Uh, Reveal helps to claim reveal claims to help solve this problem and prevent meltdowns in children with ASD. Similar to the Apple Watch and other fitness trackers, Reveal by Awake Labs is a wearable device that measures and tracks physiological changes that signify a change in stress and anxiety levels. Specifically, Reveal measures heart rate, temperature, and electrodermal activity, which has to do with um, sweat, how much you sweat and perspiration. The corresponding app tracks these changes over time and eventually will be able to notify parents or caregivers or educators if a child is physically stressed or, as they claim, about to have a meltdown. Preventative measures can then be taken to relieve the child and offer support. Some downfalls with this technology is that for the watch um, or wearable to receive data from the phone and vice versa, they must remain in reasonably close proximity to each other due to the limitations of Bluetooth Otherwise, they must be connected to Wi-Fi. Secondly, haptic cues or different vibration patterns could pose problems to those with sensory issues that wouldn't be able to tolerate the vibration or pressure from the wristband. 
Another popular form of wearable device includes those featuring heads-up displays as seen in virtual and augmented reality devices. Firstly, there is a difference between virtual and augmented reality. Virtual reality allows you to experience a reality that isn't real. It allows you to create and experience an environment that is a complete simulation. For example, the Oculus Rift allows the user to have full control over the creation of an environment. Florio is a virtual reality application targeted at children with ASD that provides an engaging and supervised experience to the user. Florio utilizes story-based intervention strategies as well as modeling and naturalistic observation strategies to build real-world social and communication skills. Augmented, augmented reality, on the other hand, allows you to see your current environment with augmented features or stamps on top of it. <clears throat> As I mentioned previously, children with ASD often find it difficult to read facial expressions, pick up visual cues, or pay attention to another person while they speak. Possibilities are seemingly endless for this form of technology and the treatment of ASD. The creation of simulated environments for use in story-based interventions, modeling, as well as behavioral interventions and social skills, training could be immensely convenient and helpful to those who benefit from more from dynamic visual and auditory displays as opposed to written instruction. For example, the child wears a head-mounted display which shows images of a virtual classroom. This classroom contains a set of 3D virtual classmates or avatars who deliver an individual presentation. But each of these avatars starts to fade if the child looks away or loses interest. This helps keep the child's focus and attention on presenters and replication of the behavior will help build eye contact and attention skills. Similarly, as with other wearable devices, children with sensory sensitivities may have trouble tolerating the constant pressure from the head-mounted display or the projected holographics themselves, depending on brightness or saturation levels. I wanna preface this next section with a little aside about speech synthesis, which has come a long way in recent years. Whoops. Um, being able to normalize computer generated phrases and voices to the point where they're somewhat personalized plays a huge role in how we perceive and respond to our artificial intelligence like devices. Uh, think your Amazon Alexa or Google Home type things. Um, for our purposes today, when I refer to artificial intelligence or AI, I'm referring to Siri or Google Now. Yes, these programs are not explicitly AI, as true artificial intelligence is completely independent, but these programs that are designed to respond in a preset and calculated way based on human interaction. These programs present an opportunity to gain information quickly and directly the developing social pragmatics of the AI and robotics industries play a huge role in the success of their products. By this, I mean in the last 10 years or so, speech recognition and face and emotion recognition algorithms have become increasingly better and more accurate. As of now, we don't really have conclusive evidence for how educational robots can be, but they can assist and can be pre-programmed for activities which help engage students. These socially assistive robots aim to serve as social catalysts and can be used, utilized in a form of peer skills training. The robots first provide an opportunity for a child with ASD to practice social skills one-on-one, -on -one, then with a sibling or therapist, then with other children. One of their main goals is to encourage inclusion of the ASD population. <clears throat> Typically developing children don't usually seek out children with ASD in activities such as free play, but with the presence of a robot in this setting, the children with ASD are gaining social support while typically developing children are also being drawn into the experience by the robot itself, promoting play interaction among all peers. When children with ASD are engaged and comfortable, they're better able to learn. Robots are also very versatile and customizable to the individual needs and skills of a child with ASD. Children with ASD often see the robot as less confusing and intimidating than their peers because the robots are patient. Some are programmed to speak slower and can repeat things over and over again exactly the same way without getting frustrated. And with a limited range of facial expressions, robots are less likely to express emotions that can be misinterpreted or confusing to a child with ASD. 
Some of the ma major players in the field of socially assisted robots for children with ASD include Leica, Now, Darwin, OP2, and Milo. This is Milo. Leica's goal is to help children with ASD become more independent and improve their motor and social skills. Based on a child's abilities, users can customize the level of difficulty and how much guidance children get for each of Leica's games. Leica also monitors the child's progress by capturing and storing data on how the children interact with the robot. Now's tasks are semi-autonomous educational applications inspired from various behavioral interventions and models like ABA and PECS. For example, Now prompts a student, waits for the appropriate response, and provides a reward when the response is correct or when the response is incorrect, encouragement, and a clue. Teachers can select and personalize tasks based on a child's individual learning goals, motivators, internal states, and personality. Now also responds to voice commands and tracks each child's performance. Darwin OP2 can engage children with ASD to do motor activities by playing soccer, dancing, and performing other activities. For example, Darwin OP2 can say in a monotone voice that he is excited to be friends and play soccer while he kicks you with a little ball or while he kicks the little ball towards you, not at you. Milo has proven to be very effective at reaching children with autism who have difficulty interacting socially with peers. Milo teaches the understanding and meaning of emotions and expressions and demonstrates appropriate social behavior and responses. Research conducted by the University of Texas at Dallas found that children working with a therapist and Milo are engaged 70 to 80% of the time compared to just three to 10% of the time with traditional approaches. Some of the challenges that come with computer learning and robotics include the technical obstacles of the robot or artificial intelligence system itself, understanding the user's intent, emotions, needs, and skills, all while evaluating and reacting in real time. Then the robot must behave in such a way as to engage the user, because if the user isn't engaged in interacting with the robot, they will lose interest and therefore won't benefit from the support the robot is offering. While robots can be programmed to be empathetic and non-discriminatory, these machines still cannot fully replace or replicate human emotion or understanding. These and all technology-based interventions should be used as a supplement to human interactions with traditional strategies. I do want to touch on a few applications. Um, there are a ton out there, so I'm not going to go over everything. Um, and you can find lists upon lists online just by Googling. Um, but all, there are a lot of applications made available out there that are designed specifically for children with ASD. Um, you can filter through these in search engines um, in the app or Google Play Store by searching with the keywords autism apps or AAC apps. Here in this diagram I have is a list of iPad apps that support different evidence-based practices for autism spectrum disorders. Um, like I mentioned, there are hundreds of thousands of apps available on the market today and hundreds more being developed every week. The apps represented in the graphic are only few examples of what is out there and are divided into only a few of the evidence-based practices we talked about earlier. Some of these apps, of course, can fit into multiple categories. Every, like I said, every child with ASD has individual needs, preferences, and characteristics. It's up to you as the parents to choose the best app for each child. This infographic is meant for informational purposes only to illustrate how apps support evidence-based practices and to use as you deem appropriate. Also, as I've mentioned, these devices and software can be extremely beneficial for a child with ASD. At the same time, they can be extremely expensive. While a child with ASD has many barriers to face on their own, obtaining access to these potentially life-changing devices should not be one of them. I also want to offer a couple of ways and resources to help make these more accessible. I want to preface this by asking you to first do your research, compare devices, models, versatility, prices, and accessories before beginning this process. Um, it's best to know exactly what will best suit your child and your family's needs before diving in. The most common and straightforward option to securing a device is self-pay. Obviously, it's not always the most feasible, but some ways to accomplish this are to have your bank account automatically transfer funds from one account to another account specifically for saving for a device, similar to how you can set up auto pay for a phone bill. 
You can also try redoing your monthly budget to get an accurate picture of exactly where your funds are going and see if any can be rerouted to the savings account. Always keep an eye out for sales and promotions going on at local retailers, but also be aware of scams. Craigslist may not always be your best option. You can try the Amazon Renewed um, program where you can find certified refurbished, pre-owned and open box products that are specialist tested and come with a 90 day warranty. I think Best Buy does a similar program as well. Um, you can also brainstorm ways to bring in more money such as putting on a garage sale, um, bake sale or small scale fundraiser in your community or offer up contract or freelance work on the side if you have the time. You can also earn funds for your child's device by setting up an account via um, online fundraiser sites. You can forward the account information link to all friends and family who could help donate or purchase items for you. But do be aware that a majority of these sites takes a percentage of the donations, so be sure to factor that into your overall cost of your device. Um, a lot of these sites pair well with Facebook, Twitter, and um, well-known blogging sites and different social media that makes it really easy to spread and share your specific page, your fundraiser, and be seen by a bigger audience. Um, raffles and giveaways typically offer iPads as prizes. Um, deadlines and qualifications are always changing, so you do want to be sure to stay up to date by checking the various organizations, websites, and social media pages frequently. Um, for example, here at the Johnson Center, we offer an iPad as a raffle prize after referring a friend who participates in one of our research studies. And another way you can find more, of there's some listed here on the screen, you can always just Google iPad giveaway, iPad raffles. Um, just be weary when you do that of various fake offers. Another way you could try and obtain a device is by talking to your insurance company. Ask about your pol policies coverage for DME or durable medical equipment. Do your research and know which apps, devices, and software in particular you want to use and which of your child's needs they will be addressing. For example, you can argue that an iPad, an app like Proloquo to, to Go would be beneficial for your child, not only for expressive communication, but also um, the calendar app on the iPad would be beneficial for maintaining the routine and expectation management. Be sure when talking to your insurance company that you bulk or combine the device, its protective case, and any necessary apps together for a full package as accessories um, and AAC apps tend to be pretty expensive. Also, you want to be sure that your child's needs should be backed up by professionals um, when talking to your insurance company. Following this communication example, you would want to have letters of medical necessity written by your child's speech therapist, behavior, behaviorist, or any other applicable professional. Um, include your child's latest assessment or evaluation, and maybe even videos of your kiddo using the device in therapy if possible. Try to also include a peer-reviewed article you found related to iPad use as communication device as further evidence of its efficacy. If you are denied by insurance, don't give up. Um, if you can always try to um, ask for reconsideration, if they still just keep denying you and everything fails with insurance, keep the denial letter and look at other places where you might find help. Um, many charities or organizations or grants will wanna see that you've already asked your insurance and were denied. Um, so get that in writing and be sure to hold on to it. You can also ask your child's school for help by writing assistive technology into their IEP as you would any therapy or accommodation. Um, quick note as an aside here, if you need help navigating the school system and obtaining accommodations for your child, as well as the rights as a parent and student, please see our YouTube channel where we offer webinars over that topic specifically. Meanwhile, you can start by asking for an evaluation done by a clinician who is familiar with your child as well as um, they're also familiar with the device. Then ask for a meeting to amend your child's IEP. Add in the need for assistive, te assistive technology, the device, as well as the protective case, and any particular apps that your child would be using. Again, you wanna make that all a bundle. Um, 
Because the iPad would technically be school property, you should also specify how and when your child would be using the iPad. Like if they take it home um, for private tutoring sessions or over summer break, um, this way it will be written into the IEP and can be better enforced. Lastly, you should apply for grants, all of the grants. There is no limit on how many grants you can apply to. Um, individual grants have a unique application process, different guidelines and deadlines. Um, I have a few lists, a few different websites listed here on the slide, um, but it's the autism community has been especially vocal about the benefits of the iPad, and because of this, there are many grants aimed specifically at getting iPads for children with ASD. So start by checking the websites um, here on the screen and of other autism organizations in your area. You might have a better chance if they're local or just smaller scale. So now that I've given you kind of a brief overview, I hope that you can see the different and important roles technology play can play in ASD interventions. Um, the possibilities are seemingly endless, and as technology continues to advance, so will its role in the treatment of ASD. Lastly, I want to take a step back and look at the bigger picture here. With all of the opportunities that advancing technology affords us as a society, it's pretty important to keep in mind one of the most basic reasons for developing it in the first place, right? Technology is about making the world more inclusive. The ability to access, gather, and share hordes of information among the population of the developing world is one of the main functions of technology today. By implementing different technological devices and softwares into ASD intervention strategies, we are offering an, an opportunity to communicate with, understand, and include people with ASD. For example, the AACs I mentioned earlier, these grant the opportunity to children with ASD in language or communication needs to communicate by compensating for or replacing speech. The UK National Autistic Society has created a virtuality reality application that has been used to simulate what it's like being a child with autism. You can also view this as a web video on their website. And I'll probably put the link to that in the little um, question box or answer box if I can, because it's pretty cool. Um, to recap, many of the specific devices and or programs I have mentioned today have been used in interventions for ASD that are backed by peer review, published scientific literature exploring their effect on children with ASD. Many of the augmentative and alternative communication devices we talked about are fairly recent innovations and are therefore don't have the scientific backing that older established treatments do. Nonetheless, these devices are being created and expanded upon every day. <clears throat> these new wave innovations can be more accessible, adaptive, portable, and customizable than older models and have come a long way in the past 50 years. I hope that with this webinar, I've outlined different areas of need in which technology can make a difference in the lives of children with ASD. Different forms of technology, namely apps, are developing every day, and I hope that by highlighting the different roles that technology can play in addressing the symptoms of ASD moving forward, you can better utilize these new tools in a way that works best for you and your family. As a reminder, this video will be available for playback on our YouTube channel, where you can also find additional videos with information on grants, um, funding, and accommodations in the school setting. And so now we have about just a couple minutes for questions. Let me see if I can pop out a couple of things. Oh, looks like a few of them have already been answered. The great resources you included. Um, yes, so um, the question was posed Is there a way for me to access your PowerPoints with the great resources you included? Um, we don't hand out the slides, but I will go ahead. Oh, it's not letting me do it. Um, if you want to visit our YouTube channel on youtube.com forward slash the Johnson Center, you'll have. Um, access to this um, particular video. It should be up in about a day or so, I would think. Um, but like I mentioned just in that last slide, um, you'll also have plenty of other videos about a multitude of topics. 
and it looks like that's it. Well, thank you everyone for watching um, and listening with me today. If you have any last minute questions, P, oh, the link to the YouTube UK video. Yes, I'll have, um, I'll put it in the video description when we post it to the YouTube channel. That's where I'll be able to give you that and I'll make a note of it right now. And then we'll get that um, up for you guys. If you have any last minute questions after the webinar concludes, you can just email info at johnson-center.org and we'll be able to get those questions answered for you. Thank you so much.